Hi guys, good morning and welcome to Fieldwork Live. We're here on the sunny west coast of Scotland and this morning we're going to be talking about some rocky shore ecology. My name's Jack, uh, I'm a tutor with the Ipfield Studies Council and I work at FSC Millport in the Firth of Clyde. Um, so we're out here um, on the west coast of Scotland and about to show you some rocky shore creatures and describe a little bit of um, the ecology of the environment they live in. But before we get started, um, just to get some shout outs out there, we've had people sign up from all over the world. It's been an incredible attendance. Thank you so much for logging on. We've had about 20,000 of you register so far. People from high school, six from colleges, students from all over the UK. Um, we've had staff and students from universities. We've got Worcester, Newcastle, Staffordshire, Oxford, Brighton and St Mary's University all online. Thank you very much for showing up, guys. Um, in terms of countries, people from Saudi Arabia, Kenya, the US and Spain have all logged on as well. So thank you so much. Hopefully you'll enjoy the next 45 minutes to an hour of some Rocky Shore ecology. Um, so as I said, I'm here on the west coast of Scotland in a town called Ardrossan, and I'll describe why we're here in just a minute. But um, first to go over some aims for this session. So a couple of things I'm hoping to do over the next 45 minutes. So first of all, we're going to go through some environmental gradients on the rocky shore. So what the physical environment is like to live here if you're an intertidal organism. We're also going to have a go identifying and classifying some rocky shore organisms. So naming a couple of the common species and telling you a little bit about them. And hopefully that will give you a good idea of what adaptations they have to survive on the rocky shore. Finally, we're going to use some scientific sampling techniques to measure the abundance and distribution of uh, species. And that ties us to our overall research question, really, which is how does the abundance and distribution of organisms change with height, so with vertical height, on the rocky shore? Um, before we get going, uh, just a little bit of digital housekeeping because this is a live lesson. Um, we've had some pre-submitted questions um, from you over the last week or two, which I'll try and address as we go through the lesson. We've also got a live question and answer at the end. So any questions that you have, please type into the YouTube chat box. We've got some uh, moderators online, so they will be looking at comments. Please make sure they're appropriate. Treat this just like you're a lecture or a lesson at school. Um, so send some questions only, please. Um, we've also got some of our FSC experienced tutors answering your questions live in the chat. So we've got Joe and Janine who hopefully, if you guys type in some questions, I'll try and answer some live, but they'll also try and type some answers into the chat box as well. So before we get going with our field work, um, I just wanted to, I think, to go over a little bit why rocky shores are important. So why am I standing here uh, on a coastline in a random bit of Scotland talking about rocky shores? Well, first of all, they're a really, really big habitat. So even though we're a small island nation, if you imagine the map of the UK, we've got quite a large area of coastline. So we actually have 20,000 miles of coastline in the UK. So this intertidal habitat is really important. And rocky do make up quite a, a large amount of the, um, of the intertidal habitat, especially in the north and in the west. They're also an important food source. So obviously for organisms that live here, but even for organisms that don't. So we have birds coming in to feed. We have fish swimming at high tide. So it's a really important food source for both the terrestrial and the marine environment. The habitats that you find on the rocky shore, all of the crevices and nooks and crannies, they provide really good shelter for organisms as well. So think of the rocky shore a little bit like a nursery ground, like a coral reef or a mangrove um, forest that allows little juvenile um, organisms to survive and escape from predators. As you can see hopefully behind me, there's also lots of marine algae. So there's loads of seaweed, which just like terrestrial plants, is uh, contributing oxygen and also taking food carbon dioxide and acting as a carbon sink. So in terms of our atmosphere, again, rocky shores are very important. Um, there, we also have um, the rocky shores acts as uh, coastal protection. So imagine kelp forests just offshore um, absorbing some of the impact of waves from storms. So it's actually helping us um, prevent coastal erosion as well. And finally, it's a really good environment to get across some scientific sampling skills and some ecological concepts that are that come into your A-level biology, your Scottish Advanced Higher GCSE or Scottish Nationals. Um, so it's a good chance to get over some ecological concepts and to chat about them in quite an interesting environment. So um, I'm going to chat briefly about our location. So hopefully, you've, uh, if you've had a look at the pre-course information, so the story map and the location fact file, you've hopefully read quite a lot about Pottery Bay. And that's our usual um, rocky shore site for Millport Field Centre on the Isle of Cumbria. However, because we're in lockdown and our movements are a little bit restricted, as, as with many of you, um, we can't get over to the island at the moment. So we've come down um, to the town of Ardrossan, which is where I live, and we're on a rocky shore just outside my apartment um, to lead the lesson from here. So I'd like you to just have a look behind me. 
look at the environment and then back to the story map and the location fact file and have a think about how this environment that we are that we're in now is slightly different to the one that you might have learned about. And if you have any comments, you can pop those in the chat box as well. So if you could suggest how this environment behind me is different to the one that you've read about. And what we'll do, we'll put up an image of Cobra Bay onto the screen now. So if you take some more in the fact file, we'll that will remind you. Okay, so you can see a very beautiful little bit of snow on the mountains of Arran. And actually, you can see Arran behind me. Um, so that same island that you can see the snow in the mountains, that's, that's just behind me. So you can see it's more or less the same bit of coastline. So hopefully some of you guys have noticed that um, the environment is slightly different. We have more of a human impact here. So as you can see, we're on a bit of seawall. So much of the substrate is, is concrete. Okay, rather than the natural sandstone that we get on the island. So the substrate that you stood on, you can see just behind me, is slightly different. So rather than natural rock, we've got a bit of concrete. Also, because we're a bit closer to a town, there's a footpath just behind me, so there might be more human disturbance, and we might also get more things like litter and other consequences of having more humans nearby. So, just some general differences. However, uh, some similarities, it's all the same ocean. So, we're literally only a couple of miles down the coast. So, all the organisms will be the same, the water temperature is the same, um, and even the way we're facing is more or less the same. So, Pottery Bay faces southwest, we're facing kind of west southwest here. Um, so even the exposure is, is very similar. So we're going to have a look at our methodology for today. So how are we going to study the abundance and distribution of organisms on the rocky shore? And I've got some equipment to help me out. Um, but first, we're going to talk about how we're going to go about this. So most people, most scientists, when they measure abundance and distribution, they do it along a transect line. And for anyone that's done this before, you've probably used a tape measure. That's really good for looking at horizontal changes. We want to look at vertical changes. So the tide comes in and comes out um, twice a day. So we have two high tides and two low tides every day in the UK. And here in the third tide where we are, the difference between high tide and low tide is about three or four meters. So we want to look at the changes that go down vertically rather than horizontally. So to do that, we need some slightly different equipment that, that, that's not a tape measure. So the first thing we're going to use, and um, hopefully some of you guys will remember these from bits of field work at school or university. So these are ranging poles. So these are miniature ones that I've got for a demonstration. In real life, they're two meters tall. And each one of these sections is 50 centimeters. Okay. So these are used for measuring changes in angle um, and changes in height. But they don't work by themselves. You need to use them in conjunction with another piece of equipment. And that piece of equipment is known as a clinometer. You can get physical ones that have a little rotating dial and that you look through a little bit like a telescope. Or if you don't have one of those, you can use your phone. So there's loads of clinometer apps, which basically means you put it on your phone uh, and you can tilt the phone a little bit like a spirit level and you can look along it and maybe look up or look down and it will tell you the angle. So if you don't have a proper clinometer, you can get a free clinometer app really, really easily. So the way that works with the ranging poles, um, if these two ranging poles were on level ground, so at the same height, when you put the clinometer on the top of the white section of the first pole, okay, um, if you looked across at the other section of the white pole, um, that angle would be zero, okay, if you're on level ground. So rather than looking at the same section, we're going to look 50 centimetres higher. Because 50 centimetres is the difference in height we want to look at today. So rather than looking at the same section, I'm going to actually look at the top of the red section. Okay, so I'm going to move down the shore. And when the top of this red section lines up with the bottom of the original red section, we know that we have gone down the shore 50 centimetres. So if you imagine they're level, you walk down the shore and you keep measuring the angle until that angle is zero. And if you put them together, obviously you can see we've gone down 50 centimetres. Um, that's where I drop my quadrat, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And then after you've done that, all you do, you take the top ranging pole and you do the same. You'd walk down and you'd find another 50 centimetre drop and you do that all the way down the shore. So there are sampling equipment in terms of uh, putting our quadrat down. So I've used the word quadrat already, but I'm aware that I haven't um, talked about this. So hopefully from your specifications, most of you will know what a quadrat is. Um, they all look slightly different, but essentially they all do the same thing. These are a bit of equipment that's designed to um, sample the abundance within an area. So all they do is define an area. 
you get very, very small ones, you get 50 centimeter ones. The one that we've got is, is a meter squared quadrat because we want to get a big area on the rocky shore and we want to be able to move around inside the quadrat to find all the organisms. So I've got a meter squared quadrat. And as you can see, it's open, which means there's no grids. Sometimes there's grids that go down that help you um, measure things like percentage cover. This one's open, which means we can access everything from the quadrat. Okay? So this is my open quadrat, and we put the quadrat down every time that ranging pole gets to an appropriate height. So I'm going to put it down on the shore behind me, and hopefully Sarah, who's behind the camera today, will be able to um, put on the camera a little bit, and we'll be able to look um, at where this is going. So I've put my, I've put my quadrat down here. Um, and as you can see, um, I've tried to make sure that it's all level. So what I don't want to do, I don't want to put it down on the top of a boulder or in a pool. I want to put it down somewhere where it's all level. Once my quadrat's down, I'm then going to start looking. I'm going to start looking at the organisms within the quadrat. Okay. So the first thing I tend to do is I tend to go for the organisms that can't move first. So for things like seaweed and lichen. Um, and then we'd move on to the things that can move some of the animals. So step one is, is finding an organism that looks fairly dominant in your quadrat, a nice easy one to start with. So you might pick one of the seaweed species. You would then use your identification guide to identify it. So if you've got a Rocky Shore identi identification guide, fantastic. If not, you have photos of all the species in your live lesson handouts and also they're up on the story map as well. So you find some images of the organisms you want to identify and you find its common name or its Latin name. So the first step is identifying it. After that, we're then going to measure its abundance. And we do this using what's known as an abundance scale. So the scale we're going to use, and again, you can find this on your live lesson handout, is known as a SAC4 scale. So this, hopefully, um, you, can, you can see this is broadly what you should be looking at, your live lesson handout. And you can see our SAP4 abundance scale is, it's got lots of different scales and it's essentially a method to count uh, species that are completely different types. So normally if we're looking at plants and seaweed, we'd be looking at percentage cover, whereas animals we would be looking at density. So the number of animals per unit area, because you can't measure the percentage cover of crabs. And equally, it's very hard to measure what is an individual seagrass or an individual lichen. So this scale uh, is really good. It allows you to measure the abundance of animals, plants, lichen, algae, all using the same scale. And SAC4 is just an acronym that stands for the different levels of abundance. So superabundant, abundant, common, frequent, occasional, or rare. Okay. So once you've identified your species, you'd have a look and you'd find the appropriate scale to use. And the two that we're going to be using today is scale one for very small organisms under one centimetre, and scale four, which is for crusts and meadows, basically for seaweed and lichen. Okay, so you've got your species, you've got your SAC4 scale, you'd measure the abundance, you'd write it down on your data table, which is, which is here, and then you'd move on to the next species. So after the lichen, and after the seaweed, I then start moving that seaweed aside to look underneath and try and find some crabs and fish maybe. And then finally, you can gently roll over the boulders and have a look under there. A lot of the mobile creatures live under the boulders. So looking under the boulders is a really, is a really good idea if you're out on the rocky shore. Okay, so we're gonna do that um, for three different quadrats. So you guys have three photo quadrats, which I'll come on to in a minute. But first, I'd like you to use the chat box and suggest um, some pros and cons of this method, okay? So what's great about using this method and maybe what's not so good? And I'm gonna have a look at the live chat box um, in, in a minute and I'm gonna see if you've, you've suggested anything. In the meantime, while I'm waiting for some answers to come through, I'm just gonna talk about different environmental gradients. So as you've seen on the pre-lesson handout and on the story map, um, we have different zones of the rocky shore. So we have the splash zone, which is pretty much always dry, only really gets splashed by waves occasionally. We've got the upper shore, which spends most of the time out of the water, the middle shore, about half and half, and the lower shore, which spends pretty much most of its time covered up. And then we have the subtidal zone. We also have some environmental gradients that run between these zones, so run down the shore. So things like moisture is going to change. If you're at the top of the shore, you're going to dry out really, really quickly, or you're going to desiccate. That's the, uh, that's the, that's the scientific word for drying out. You've also got changes in light. As you go further down underwater, you're going to have less light. Things like salinity might change. If you're at the top of the shore in a rock ball, it starts raining. The salinity is going to drop. 
So some of the organisms at the top of the shore have to deal with salinity changes as well. And the same with oxygen. If you're stuck in a rock pool, it's a really hot, sunny day, the, the plants are going to be photosynthesizing and you're going to be fine. Uh, at night, when there's no sun, no photosynthesis, no photosynthesis, all of the oxygen is going to become depleted in the rock pool. So we've got some different um, uh, environmental gradients going down the shore. So we've got um, some disadvantages coming through. So we've got, um, it disrupts the environment. That's a really good one. Yeah, we don't want to be really carelessly rolling over rocks and crushing organisms. Um, and also we need to be careful where we're putting our feet. So we don't want to trample anything. So when we lift up a rock, we do it very, very gently. We lift it up, we have a look at under the, uh, underneath the organ organisms, and then we roll it back the way we found it. So we don't want to go turfing up all the rocks and ripping the roof off all these organisms' houses. Um, we've also got a, a, another disadvantage, that it's not representing the whole environment. Yeah, absolutely, we're only looking at a metre squared. So we might have, just flukily where you put your um, quadrat, you might have missed some of the species that should be there. You know, there might be a little crevice that's affected it. There might be a couple of boulders. And um, so it might not be representative of this. We've also got it disadvantages mobile organisms. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, so um, I can look for the mobile organisms. However, for the photo quadrats that you're going to look at, you're obviously going to be restricted to what you can just see from a photo. You guys aren't going to be able to go turfing around under the rocks. But don't worry, because I went down at low tide and I found some of the mobile organisms to show you. So, so don't worry. So, uh, I'm just going to go through the three species that you guys are going to look for in your photo quadrats, and then we're going to put some of the photo quadrats up, give you a little bit of time to look at them, and we're going to go through the answers. So, the first one we're going to look at is our orange sea lichen. So, this is known as Caloplaca mariner, um, and this is um, a composite organism. So, um, hopefully you guys um, have read a little bit about lichen, and you know that they're not one organism, they are a symbiotic relationship between a, a fungus, which provides the structure, and um, a microalgae, which provides the energy, okay? So these are really tolerant of rocky shore environments, especially these yellowy ones. So these can cope with a whole range of salinities, and they're a really important food source for lots of different grazers, so the snails and the crustaceans on the rocky shore. We've also got um, spiral rat. So this is probably one of the most common species you'll find um, on the rocky shores of the UK. And this is an upper shore species, okay? Um, you can identify it, um, it's a brown algae, and it seems to have twisted um, fronds. So these leaf things are they're known as the fronds, and they're a little bit twisted, which is an adaptation, uh, as, in, as the name suggests, spiral rack. They spiral and twist as it dries. So that traps some of the moisture between the layers, and hopefully that stops it drying out. However, even if it does dry out, spiral rat can survive losing 80% of its moisture before it dies, which is incredible. So imagine you losing 80% of the moisture in your body and still being able to function. So spiral rat is incredibly good at surviving desiccation on the rocky shore. Uh, and it spends about 90% of its time out of the water. So it needs to be well, well adapted, otherwise it wouldn't be able to live here. So we've got a spiral rack, and the way you identify it, it doesn't have bladders. So those air sacs that you sometimes find on seaweed, it doesn't have them. But what it does have are tiny um, little reproductive sacs at the end. So they're not bladders. If you were to squeeze one, some clear jelly comes out of the end. And that's, that's basically the reproductive part of the plant. Okay. So we've got a spiral rack. Last but not least, we've got our animal that we're going to look at. And the animal I've chosen um, for today are barnacles. Okay, so everybody knows what barnacles are, hopefully. We've um, all walked down the rocky shore and trodden on these little bricky things. Um, so these barnacles are incredibly good at surviving. Um, this is the acorn barnacle, Semibalanus balanoides, um, the most widespread barnacle in the UK. Um, it's about, it can grow up to about 1.5 centimeters, and it's made up of six plates that go around. And um, the barnacles, the, the way they survive on the rocky shores, they're having a little trap door. So when the tide comes in, the trap door opens and they have a feeding appendage that's a bit like a feather that comes out and catches particles of food from the water. When the tide goes out, that trap door shuts. So it keeps in some moisture, it traps that water in so the barnacles can survive for hours and hours out of the water. Barnacles also have a very cool um, adaptation for surviving on the rocky shore. So because they are sessile, they can't move, they're stuck. They still need to sexually reproduce, but, but they can't move. So barnacles have one of the longest penis to body ratios of any animal in the animal kingdom. It can be up to eight times its own body length. So that allows it to fertilize all of the barnacles around without moving. 
which is pretty awesome. And if it can't reach any of them, it can always fertilize itself as well. So pretty weird, pretty weird sexual reproduction from some barnacles. So they're your three species. And um, what I would like you to do for the photo quadra exercise, hopefully um, you've got this in front of you. Okay, this is what you're gonna need. You're gonna need your sat four scale and the different um, quadrats. The scales we're gonna use four one. Okay, so we're in a minute, we're gonna put up photo one on the screen for about 60 seconds, okay? And um, if you don't have enough time to do it all, don't worry, this um, lecture or this whole session is gonna be up on the Edu uh, Encounter website, the Encounter Edu website, uh, about an hour after the broadcast. Okay, so don't worry if you don't have enough time. We, we just wanna fit lots in for you while we're live. So don't panic, if you haven't finished, you can access this whole video later. So I'd like you to use the species, use the abundance scale, and come up with one of the letters, so S, A, C, F, O, or R, and for the abundance of the species in that quadrat. Okay. You can also download the full photos from the Encounter Edu website. And I do recommend you do that because it can be a little bit tricky to see the full photos from the PDF. So you can download the full high-res photos, which allows you to zoom in and move around. Okay. So we're hopefully going to put that first photo up, quadrat one, from the, from the splash zone, and I'm going to give you a minute to, uh, to have a look at it. Okay, guys, welcome back. Hopefully that was long enough. There was only one species in that quadrat, so hopefully that was enough time to measure its abundance. Uh, for quadrat number one, we were looking for this orange sea lichen, the Calopaca mariner. Um, and again, the scale is a bit subjective, so we might not all have the same answers. However, um, I had a look at it earlier, and I thought it was about maybe 20 or 30% um, coverage if you crammed all that yellow into, into a bit of the quadrat. About a quarter of the quadrat I thought it filled. So that would get a score of C um, for common. But again, if you got a score of F for frequent, you know, I, I think that would do. So well done if you got somewhere around about there, about 20 or 30%, which was an answer of common. So we're gonna do exactly the same thing. We're gonna put up quadrat number two for about 60 seconds. This time there are two species in there for you to do. Okay, so we'll put the species, we'll put the quadrat up. See you, see you in 60 seconds. Hi guys, welcome back. Um, hopefully that was long enough for you to get the two species that were in there. The two species we we're looking for were spirorac, obviously the seaweed, and that covered about half 
of the bottom of the quadrant. So I thought I was around about half, about 50%. Um, and that would have got you a score of A for abundant. Um, and in fact, if you had put any answer between 40 or 79%, it all would have got the same score as A. Okay, so hopefully some of you at home got that. And um, for barnacles, it's a little bit trickier because we have to use the number of barnacles per unit area and the units of area decrease. So we're looking for, is the one to nine per meter squared, per 30 centimeters squared, per 10 centimeters squared? And obviously it changes all over the quadrant. So you really do have to use your best estimate rather than exact counting. And um, I reckon for the barnacles, it was about one to nine per three centimeters squared. There's loads of them, especially in the top. Okay, so that would have got a score of A as well. So I thought there was probably a few too many barnacles for one, one to nine per one centimeter squared. And I thought there was probably not enough um, for, for one to 10. So I thought it was one to nine per three centimeter squared. So well done if you got something around that. Um, we're gonna go to our last quadrat. So, that, so the second quadrat we just did was actually quadrat four of a 10 quadrat transect. And we're gonna give you all of these quadrats so you can do them after the lesson if you want. So rather than being the second quadrat, that actually missed a couple and we went straight down to the upper shore from the splash zone. So that was quadrat four. The third quadrat we're gonna show you is actually quadrat eight. So this is actually the, the third to last quadrat and it's the middle shore going into the lower shore, okay? So yeah, but about, about middle shore. So we're gonna put that up on the screen now and give you a minute. Hi guys, welcome back. Hopefully you had fun with that last quadrat and you managed to get all the species. Um, just to, to go over the answers, uh, I thought spiral rack, there, were, there was not very much, there was about five or 10%. So I thought that was probably O for occasional, okay? However, you might have put F for frequent as well. And um, for barnacles, I thought there was probably one to nine per 10 centimeters or per 30 centimeters. So C or F, so common or frequent, I, I reckon that was probably about right. So let us know your answers in the chat box. And um, you can feel free to have a chat, let people know if you're all getting the same answers. Um, one of the disadvantages with this scale is it is quite ob objective. Um, so it does mean it's based on your opinion, um, but hopefully the good thing is you can ask lots of people and you can get an average. So I, I think we've got time for some more shout outs as we go through. So we've still got some more organisms to show you, um, but just to, to shout out to the people that are watching, we've had Exeter College, their biology and environmental science students. Uh, hi from Miss Day and Miss Blackett. So great guys, thank you for logging in. We've had Miss Snazdale from Ravenswood School in Kent. Great way to get immersed in some ecology, she says. Um, and remember for her students, Practical 12 is all about sampling techniques. So if you're from Ravenswood School, I hope you're taking notes. It sounds like this is gonna be important for you. And um, we've also had Mr. Smith from Collerton. So Miles, uh, nice to speak to you, Miles. Um, it's great to hear from you. Hopefully um, we're gonna see you very soon in Millport and get you back out on the boat again. So thanks for getting in touch and thanks for watching. Um, we've had Miss Brodick from, um, I hope I'm saying this right. My my Sutherland, my Sutherland. Um, sounds like it's in Wales. Um, well done, she says to her students for getting out of bed for this fabulous event. So hopefully there's enough of you out of bed. So fantastic. Um, we've also had Miss Green from Barnsley Sixth Form College telling her students to keep it up. You're doing amazing working from home and you're getting loads of work done. So just a couple of shout outs. I think we've had hundreds. Sorry, I can't go through all of them, but thank you. We do appreciate you logging in and, and sending us your comments. So now that we've done that photo quadrat method, what I'd like you to do is suggest um, potentially some uses for that method. So we talked about the disadvantages a little bit, that you can't, you've only got one angle. You can't go trolling under boulders and stuff with a photo, 
Um, however, can you think of some advantages? What's good about it? And where might you use this in real world applications? Okay. So if you can put your comments in the YouTube chat box, that would be that would be really, really good. And we can go through some of those answers. In the meantime, I've got some lower shore species that I can show you. So while you put your answers in, and I went down, low tide today was actually at seven o'clock in the morning, quarter to seven. Um, I thought that was a bit early for you guys to do a, a live lesson. I don't think many of you would have signed up for it. So I went down at low tide. I collected a load of coolest organisms I could find just so I could show you. So as you can see behind me, the tide is coming in um, and it's coming in quite fast. So um, hopefully this will give you an idea of some of the more weird and wonderful creatures you get on the rocky shore. So I'll get some of those out. So first up, we've got our butterfish. So um, I'll turn this around so, so you can see. This is a really common intertidal fish. It looks a little bit more like an eel. And this fish is really well adapted for living on the rocky shore. It hides in all the cracks and crevices and it doesn't need to be in water. So a lot of rocky shore fish only need their gills to be wet to survive. They don't actually need to be submersed in water. So this is our butterfish, very cool. It's like an eel with some black spots on the back. Um, We've also got our cool spider crab. Um, so this is this is actually a pretty cool find for an intertidal zone. Um, this is, as, as you can see, this spider crab is covered in seaweed, which it uses for camouflage. So until this moves, you really wouldn't be able to see it very well. So this is a very cool adaptation for avoiding predators. And hopefully you've had a good look at that. So does that look all right on the camera? Yeah. Fantastic. Um, okay. We've also got, this is one of the really, really, really gross creatures. So this is our bootlace worm. So even that, it looks like um, a blob of gray jelly, but this is actually a really long flexible worm that can squeeze its body into loads of cracks and crevices. And actually, if you were to pick it up, it's, it's a little bit like jelly. And the reason why it's called a bootlace worm is it's just like jelly and string. It's really quite gross and it covers your hands in, in, in a load of jelly. Um, so it, it, it's a little bit like a hagfish. It secretes this slime that allows it to escape from predators and clogs up fish gills. Um, last, but not, last but not least, we've got, our, we've got our starfish. So these are the common starfish, Asterius rubens, and you can find these on, um, on any shore around the UK at low tide. And hopefully, you can, hopefully you can see its tube feet. So it's little slippers that come out um, and help it stick to the rock. And starfish um, have a weird way of eating their prey. They go after bivalves, so things like clams and mussels. They prize them open with those sucker feet that you can hopefully see. Um, they prize them open and then they uh, eject their stomach out of their mouth. And that then secretes a load of digestive enzymes which dissolves their prey and sucks it up. Okay, so hopefully you can see the mouth there on this starfish. So again, uh, again, a very common species, um, and anyone that goes down at low tide on a rocky shore should hopefully find some some starfish in the UK. So I'm just going to hopefully that's enough time for you to suggest um, some uh, reasons why this method is good. Um, so I'll just get the the slack open. Um, so um, yeah, we've got um, some people suggesting um, that this is a good way to store data. So absolutely, you can go home and rather than just having your your written down data, you have the raw data and you can ask for second opinions. So rather than being objective and you know it's your best guess, you can show that photo to other scientists and you can get a nice reliable estimate. It's also great for collecting loads of quadrats really, really quickly. So in the time it takes me to physically count one quadrat, you could have taken the photos of 10 or 15 quadrats. And this is really important for marine surveys. So this is used quite a lot in dive surveys. So divers who are doing a benthic transect along the seafloor in the benthic environment, they only have 45 minutes or maybe 60 minutes of air. So the more quadrats they can take photos of, the more data they collect. So the method that you guys have used at home, this photo quadrat method, is actually applied quite a lot in the real world. So it's a great technique to, to um, have completed. So um, in conclusion, from, from our little bit of field work, Hopefully, you've realized that the organisms are zonated, so they do occur in different zones. So to answer our overall field question, does the distribution and abundance of um, species change as you go down the shore? Well, hopefully, from your photo quadrats and from the organisms I found here, you can see that they do. You get different organisms in different zones of the shore. 
And even looking behind me, you can hopefully see there's a band of black seaweed and then there's some barnacles and then there's some lichen. So even with the naked eye, you can see that these organisms are donated. Without even collecting data, that should, that should hopefully um, answer your question. So um, some more conclusions. Hopefully um, you've, you've realized this is an effective way to study organisms on the rocky shore. See why we've used this vertical transect, why we've used quadrats, why we've used a sac four scale. So hopefully we've justified some of those as we've gone through. And finally, I really hope you've enjoyed seeing and learning about some of our organisms on the rocky shore. So that's the other point of this live lesson, to introduce you to some stuff that you might not have realized that was there, or you might not have been able to find if you don't live near a rocky shore yourselves. So I do hope that's been beneficial to you. Um, what can you do after this? Well, some further work. We are going to have our live question and answer session in a minute. I've already got some questions coming through on my phone. But what else can you do after this session? Well, there's a load of further things for you to do. So on the story map online and on the resources you can download from the website, there's the full 10 quadrat survey. So going from the splash zone right the way down to the lower shore, and we've actually given you six more species. So rather than the three target species we were looking at, we've given you an additional six species, some fact files about them, and some identification features. So you can do a full rocky shore transect. Your teachers are also going to do some webinars with us to um, talk about how to present and analyze your data. So hopefully, in the coming days or weeks, they'll be able to go through um, uh, how to draw maybe kite diagrams, some graphs, how to do some stats tests. So what you might want, want to do to take this data further and analyze it. You can also get involved in some citizen science projects. So there's loads knocking around at the moment. CoCoast is a great one. They've still got all their resources up on the website. They have lots of intertidal surveys you can, that you can do on invasive species and stuff. And you can get involved with the, um, the big seaweed search, which does what it says on the tin, gets you out there looking for different types of seaweed. Um, and if you want more information on any of the organisms I've spoke about today, you can visit MARLIN, which stands for the Marine Life Information Network. And that's an online fact file of everything you can possibly know about every marine species in the UK. So it's a really good resource for you guys to check out. And it's completely free. You can just find the website. So hopefully we're going to go to our question and answer session. I've got some pre-submitted questions and I've got some that have been submitted live. So I'll do a couple of the pre-submitted ones and then I'll go straight to the live questions. So first of all, we have had absolutely loads of questions about climate change and the effect of that on rocky shores. From Paul in Kimbolton School, John at Thurston College, Hazel from Walton High School, George from Desborough, Alex from Altrium Grammar, John from um, Bolo, uh, Bolo Convent School and Angie from Molsham. So you've all asked about the impact of climate change on rocky shores. And the answer is yes, and it is going to have an impact over the coming decades. So we're going to see rising sea temperatures. So the temperature that these guys are immersed in, these organisms at the moment, is going to go up. And some would argue that these organisms are actually better adapted than most because they already have to deal with temperature extremes on a day-to-day -day basis. But these temperature extremes are going to get worse. Okay, so they're going to have to, on a hot day, they're going to have to deal with temperatures maybe in a couple of years regularly over 30 degrees, which is, which is pretty, uh, pretty difficult. We're also going to see rising sea levels. So sea levels are rising all around the country. And, and normally, communities of organisms would just move backwards. So because this is happening very slowly, as the sea levels rise, the organisms would ordinarily, on a natural shore, slowly move back over time. Over generations, they would move back. However, that's incredibly difficult in an urban environment. So as you can see behind me, there's a sea wall. So humans have built a wall there. So that stops these organisms moving backwards. And this phenomenon is known as coastal squeeze. So they can't do what they would normally do. They can't move backwards anymore. So slowly, our intertidal habitat is going to shrink as sea levels rise. And that's going to have a massive impact. We're also going to have ocean acidification. So as carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, the ocean absorbs more of that. And that makes seawater more acidic. This is very difficult for organisms that build their shells out of calcium carbonate, which is alkaline. So not only is there less calcium carbonate available to make their shells, but some species might also see some dissolving of their own shells. So if they put the barnacles to plankton, might start having their shells get thinner over time. So that's going to have impact for predators. Finally, we're going to have more storms and we're going to have worse storms. So organisms might get ripped off, swept out to sea, entire coastal habitats might be drastically changed because of some storms. 
So hopefully that answers some questions about climate change. We've also had a question from Susan down at Exeter College and Miles from Colleton about how similar are the species found up here in Scotland to species found in the rest of the UK, so maybe down south in Devon or Cornwall. Um, the answer is, broadly speaking, they're very, very similar. There's quite a lot of connectivity in our oceans, so there aren't really any physical barriers. And because all of the organisms I've spoken about have a planktonic larval phase, so pretty much everything I've shown you today will have a life stage that is plankton. So they'll go off, and they'll float around in the ocean for days, weeks, months, maybe even years, and then settle. So that allows them to spread really, really quickly. There are some northern specialists and southern specialists, so there are a couple of species that might be different. However, again, going back to climate change, all of our species in the south, especially as temperatures heat up, they might start drifting north. The ones in the north, they might start retreating to the north. However, they're going to run out of land in the UK pretty soon. Once they get to the north of Scotland, they're going to run out of coastal environment. So we might see some localised extinction in several decades of some of our very northern cold water species. Um, We've also had questions, um, a really nice question from George at Desborough and John from Bolo um, about how I got into marine ecology and um, what is an average day like for a marine biologist. So I think I started as a marine ecologist like pretty much every other one, um, rock pooling as a child and spending a lot of time around the marine environment. I then went to university uh, and got my degree in marine biology and I was lucky enough to work with different research organisations all around the world. And then I came back to the UK um, and, and got a job with the FSC as a tutor. So, so that's how I got into this field. Um, an average day, um, so in the morning, we'd probably prep some equipment, field or lab equipment, get everything ready, get the data sheets. We'd then head out with our students or maybe a, a group of researchers. We'd maybe head out to the rocky shore, the sandy shore. We might head out in our research vessel at Millport to collect some, uh, to deploy our marine sampling gear. We'd collect some specimens, we'd measure some environmental variables, and then we'd get back in the afternoon and evening. We'd download all that data identify and classify all the specimens, and then do some write-up and reporting work. Um, and then obviously probably dry off because it might have been raining. So, so that, that's an average day. Um, I'm going to take some live questions now that have hopefully been sent through. So um, did you experience any particular problems which got in the way of you completing your field work today? Um, yes, we did. It's very, very windy. Um, I'm trying to talk really, really loudly, but that you might have noticed that it is a little bit windy today. Um, so. Um, how would things like climate change yet? Yeah, we've hopefully covered that. Um, fantastic. Um, so we've had some live questions. Um, a couple more that have come through. Um, what is the rarest species you would find? So this was, was from Aisha at Woodford County High School. And Oscar, and can you remember where Oscar's from? Anglesey. Oscar's from Anglesey. And Oscar's been logging on for pretty much every live lesson. So thank you, Oscar, uh, to address your question. Um, every time I come to the rocky shore, I find different things. So the rarest species, are, it completely changes. Um, I love to find some of the fish species. I think that's really, really cool. Um, one of my favorites is nudibranchs. So they're otherwise known as sea slugs. They're these little shellless mollusks, and they're coming in an amazing array of colors and patterns, and they are absolutely beautiful. Um, so they're one of my favorites to find. And I think all marine biologists have a life goal to find a cephalopod on the rocky shore. So by a cephalopod, I mean maybe a squid, an octopus, or a cuttlefish hiding in a rock pool at really, really low tide. So that's 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 my life goal is to try and find a cephalopod on the rocky shore. Um, how much time we got? So we've got a couple. What time for one more question? How would you carry out a risk assessment on the rocky shore? And this is from Sarah at Northampton High School, <coughs> Northampton School for Girls. Sorry. Um, very sensible question, Sarah. And um, it, it sounds like you might be a teacher. You're a teacher, Sarah. We probably will never found out. It's, it sounds like you could be a teacher. Um, first of all, I'd identify the hazards that are present, and I'd look at what is the likelihood of that hazard hurting someone, and how bad could it be if it did hurt someone. I'd then come up with a range of different management procedures to deal with it. So things like site briefings, first aid kits, sensible footwear, weather, and tide checks. And then I'd dynamically assess everything as we go. So as I'm going through the field work, I'd be keeping an eye on everyone making sure everyone's safe, okay? So hopefully that's answered some of your pre-submitted questions. I'm really sorry if we didn't get onto all of them. We have had hundreds of questions come through, so thank you so much. And uh, remember, our uh, um, FSC specialists are still answering your questions live on the live chat. So anything I haven't covered, Joe and Janine are hopefully gonna answer over the next couple of minutes as I, as I sign us off. So um, what's, what's next in Fieldwork Live? Well. We've got, uh, we've got two weeks of live lessons pretty much, so you've still got a 
load more to come. Um, if you need more information on anything I spoke about, head to fieldwork.live. So on that website, you can see um, information and resources for all of our live lessons. You can buy some discounted publications. So ID guys that are produced by our um, publications department that will help you identify a range of different organisms. <coughs> you can also have a look for information on our field courses and our field centers, okay? So what we would normally do on a day-to-day -day ba day -day basis all around the UK at our field centers, you can find that on fieldwork.live. Coming up on Monday, on Monday the 27th, Sam is going to be taking through uh, some more biology from Sam. He's going to be taking people through relationships in ecosystems. So for any biologists that are out there, whether it's GCSE, Scottish Nationals, um, A-level or advanced higher uh, or hires, log on on Monday the 27th for Sam uh, talking about ecosystems. We've also got um, Charlie on Tuesday, the day after, the 28th. Charlie is going to be talking through some geography, some human geography, and she's going to be investigating the place. So make sure you sign up for that as well. That'll be really, really good. Um, for teachers, there are teacher webinars coming out very soon. You'll see the dates on Fieldwork Live website, and we will go through everything in terms of follow-up um, activities and sessions for, in, for this rocket ship topic and the others that we've covered in the um, please let us know how you found this session. We'd love to hear your comments. So please go to Fieldwork Live and leave them on the website, leave them on the YouTube chat, Let's go to Encounter Edu. Um, we'd love to know how you found this uh, session. And finally, we'd um, really love to see you at one of our field centres around the UK very soon. So hopefully we'll see you on another live lesson or in one of our field centres around the UK. So good morning and see you later.